wonderful presentation. And, Thank and let's you. take Thank it you from there. Thank you. All right. So <clears throat> the next speaker now that I'm going to introduce is, is also a speaker who's very close to my heart. Um, her name is um, Priya Chetty. She's actually one of the, I, I would call it forefathers, but actually one of the foremothers of cyber law in South Africa. She, she worked at one of the, the earliest ICT law firms, established her own firm, Chetty Law. She then went into consulting with, with various international consulting firms. And her recent pet project is a, a multinational or should I say multi-regional uh, consultancy called Endcode. Um, she consults for various international organizations, both in Africa and um, overseas. And yeah, um, uh, Priya, I think I've said a mouthful about you. Um, her presentation today is going to be access to information and data for good ages. And yeah, I'm looking forward to hear from, from Priya. Uh, she's never disappointed. Over to you, Priya. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cisbre. It's, uh, it's always quite a bit of pressure when, uh, when I hear your introductions. But, uh, but let me thank you for uh, inviting me and I suppose re-inviting me to, uh, to Lex Informatica. It's always a pleasure, um, not just to, to share some emerging thoughts, but also to connect with the community of cyber lawyers that you managed to uh, keep intact. So, so it's always good to, to come back to this room and, and see colleagues and friends again. Um, I think that uh, from, from the presentations that I've seen, I think I'm going to be one of those outliers because the presentations have been so rich and so informative in terms of the current regulation and, and policies and so on that we're seeing. And I think my presentation is going to be slightly different because it's in, in an emerging area. Um, so it's in an what I think is an understudied area, especially on the on the continent. Um, and so what I want to share with you is just some thoughts as they're emerging and, and as they're formulating, um, just in terms of um, new areas that, that we can develop um, cyber law in. So um, it's the presentation is titled Access to Information in a Data for Good Age. And, and if you all bear with me, I'll share with you some thoughts and some of the things that we have been working on and why I am potentially obsessed with, uh, with this emerging area of law. So the first um, area of the presentation is called Data for Good. Um, and I just wanted to, to unpack this a bit. I think all of us are familiar with the various data analytics initiatives and data science initiatives and so on. And so it's a little bit of a stretch and a shift change to then start speaking about what data for good is and, and what its potential is. So the data for good movement encourages using data in meaningful ways to solve humanitarian issues around poverty, health, human rights, education, and the environment. Uh, these are the areas that have been prominent so far in the data, good, data for good movement. Um, from preventing life-threatening illnesses to protecting endangered species to rebuilding after natural disasters, organizations across the globe are harnessing data to make a difference. And applying data for social good has led to new and creative ways to address global issues. And I think that is the, is the exciting part of it in the sense that we are stumbling on the potential um, that exists within the data sets that we are creating and within the data um, uh, in, in, in terms of the leaps that we have in the science of how we use the data. So what we are aware of is that public and private organizations hold vast amounts of data and, and not just the data that we're submitting in forms and the data that we are submitting in, in publications and in very structured ways, but also the data that you know, comes from the monitoring of our movement or um, the clicks uh, on sites and the transactions 
that we do on a daily basis, um, the likes um, that we that we have on social media and so on. So there's a vast amount of data uh, that exists and sits within public and private organizations. And I'm sure this number is outdated, but the last time someone spoke about it, they spoke about 2.5 quintillion bytes of data every day. So a quintillion is, is, is one followed by 18 zeros. Um, so, so that's a lot of data. And, and of course, and then we then start to get a little excited and a little curious about what this means in a data-driven world. So to give you some examples, these are some of the more popular examples uh, of data for good projects. Um, there was a project where uh, a team was trying to understand, for instance, why in, in uh, specifically in the US, there was this uncharacteristic amount of hospital readmissions and they wanted to understand why. And by looking at the data over time, they found a correlation between lower incomes, um, health risks such as smoking and obesity and so on, and readmissions. And by identifying you know, these kinds of, uh, of diagnosis, they, they could address this and try and prevent the readmissions. And, and you can see that not only does this have you know, a benefit from a socioeconomic perspective in getting someone healthier, it also has an economic benefit because we're limiting the amount of money we will spend on somebody being in a public hospital. So there was another case, for instance, the Data Driven Justice Initiative, also a popular example. Um, and this um, tried to tackle this problem of how we constantly see this repeating cycle of uh, incarceration and release when it comes to, um, to people you know, entering and exiting jail. So why are we seeing this uh, repeat offenses and, and incarceration? And what they could do by diagnosing the issues from the data is try and prevent people from, uh, from recommitting uh, an offense and coming back to jail. So we are, you know, it, it isn't that we're just accepting the status quo of the societal um, issues that we see, but now using the data, we, we can understand uh, why certain things are the way, are the way they are in, in society. And then another popular project was the collaboration between Give Directly and, and Datakind. And that's also an example of where nonprofit organizations are now teaming up with data scientists. And what they did was they, they had this issue where they had quite a bit of resources to allocate um, to address poverty, but they could not identify exactly where to take the resources. And so one of the indicators that they used was um, to look at thatched versus metal roofs in rural villages to be able to pinpoint those um, in dire need of, of financial assistance. Um, so these are some of the examples that we see in terms of how data for good can, can be applied. Um, what I also just wanted to put up is just how people may be collaborating in this space. And, and, and there are also some you know, opportunities and, and some developments here. So an organization such as the Public Data Lab will be a kind of interdisciplinary collaborative, um, take an interdisciplinary collaborative approach, bring people together at the intersection of, of research, democratic engagement and data-driven models and so on. And so what they would like to see is basically to, um, to try and understand and, and, and appreciate what is happening in society, but then have specific interventions to deal with some of the issues, um, as well as to drive participation. So to broaden the engagement um, uh, after a, a specific problem is diagnosed. And at the heart of all of that will be an underlying openness in the way that the research is conducted and the data is shared and, and if there is code um, in the way that the code is developed and shared as well. And so, and so when, you, when we see data for good coming together, it really isn't just the data science element. It is this big collaborative mechanism and the growing of an ecosystem where people are coming together to, to do the kind of work that really shifts society in a number of ways. Um, and what I also just put on is just another example. Um, there was a project called Save Our Air. And, and some of the work they did was typical kind of data science -y type work. 
And one of the projects that they had was called Hot Potato. And if you've been to as many kids' parties as I have, um, specifically over the last few years, then you'll know that the hot potato game is where you pass, uh, it's similar to pass the parcel and when the music stops, um, you know, the person is holding the potato has to, has to leave. And so taking that analogy, they tried to understand, um, they did the typical data science projects and study pollution patterns and, and tried to diagnose and solve those. But then they thought that they could repurpose that data in a different way. And so the hot potato project was trying to work at understanding governance issues. So was there a problem with people taking responsibility for their pollution patterns? And so by using the existing data from, from other projects, they were also able to identify patterns in, in responsibility and accountability and so on. And, and, and do new governance type work in terms of, of pollution um, solutions. Okay, so um, probably one of the biggest points to drive home if we're speaking about data for good is that it isn't just that data science element. And there are four large categories that we speak about when we speak about data for good. On the one hand, we could have volunteers that produce data product, products um, either for free, so, so you know these are your typical hackathons and so on, or um, they may be doing that as a subsidized rate, so you could have a community coming together to take certain available data and, and, and do some insight work on that. Or you could have nonprofit or government agencies being uh, the recipients of data products. So, you know, you'll see collaborations between nonprofit organizations, data science firms, and really the data science effort is directed towards a nonprofit initiative. Um, you could also have tools for data work being donated or heavily subsidized or opened up. So, there are a number of projects where. Um, the facilities and the tools um, and the technology that is needed to do the data work would usually be um, subjected to a license or would be difficult to access and those tools themselves get, get donated. And then there are also a range of programs that we have to build technical capacity in, in various communities to, for people to understand how to use data um, more proficiently. So what, um, you know, does this have to do with the access to data paradigm? And, and this is where we now go into the more policy and re regulatory elements. So there are a number of calls. Uh, people, uh, you know, on, on the one hand, um, you know, the data scientists who are very excited about the potential of the data that exists. But on the other hand, human rights advocates, um, digital rights advocates um, are calling for greater access to, to the data that is available. And, and what the search is for is the ideal facilities and, and ways in which we can, we can access, um, access the data. People are speaking about data being treated as public goods, for instance. And so, you know, just by doing that, there's obviously a, a huge change in, in seeing data as a commodity and introducing a transactional element and so on. So um, there is on the one hand, this, this huge call for open access to data. And on the other hand, there is a kind of reimagining of what the frameworks and the facilities will be in order to entrench and embed um, open access to, uh, to data. So um, many of us would know about open government and, um, and that's a doctrine according to which citizens would have access to governmental documents and data for effective public oversight. So uh, on the one hand, um, when we spoke about open government, we wanted to introduce transparency mechanisms. Uh, on the other hand, we wanted to introduce accountability mechanisms. So we wanted through, through the evidence of the data that is produced by government, some way, um, some mechanism of assessing what government is doing with our data and introducing accountability for how they use our data. Another concept is open data. 
And open data doesn't mean that the data is just available for us to use, but it has to meet certain criteria. So in order for us to use it and use it easily and use it well and use it in the ways that we conceive, we need it to be structured in specific classifications um, that promote their ease of use. We need to use non-proprietary file formats. So we want to remove barriers uh, to the way in which we use the data by, by ensuring that it isn't in specific file formats, access to compliant communication interfaces, and um, I won't even dare to go into the rest. But in principle, again, that's capability of being used by, by many and have appropriate metadata describing it. So I think from the very first cyber law textbook, uh, this is where you'll remember is we, we've always spoken about the value um, that sits in metadata in, in many ways, you know, in, in terms of um, the application of justice, um, but, uh, but also now um, for its value in terms of data science and being able to understand and use data in different ways. So how does this tie in with policy and regulatory implementation? So with all this potential and with all this excitement and with all this advocacy for the exchange of data and, and the sharing of data and openness of data comes a number of interesting questions. How do we, for instance, embed data sharing values? So we know that um, public organizations have some obligations, um, but at the values level, is there a commitment um, to, to sharing the data that can be used for good? Um, and at the private sector level, is there, um, is there that value system? So we know that there are initiatives around data philanthropy. We will have huge organizations making some data sets available, but not all data sets. And so, you know, is that, is, is that what it is that we need? Or is there more to be done from, um, from a data sharing perspective and, and to entrench data sharing values? How do we embed data sharing obligations? So if we take it a step further and we move beyond the, the value system element, how do we make sure that there are obligations that cannot be escaped? or certain data to be available for certain purposes, such as um, developing cures, developing vaccines, for instance, in, in critical times, um, such as the times we, we face now. Why is the rights to information important? So when we speak about freedom of information and access to information, how does this fit in to the data-driven um, society um, that we that we will find ourselves in, and what are the links between the right of access to information um, and and the various um, you know uh, subcategories of the right to information that we know, even you know journalistic um, rights and so on. And then, what are the interrelated policies and regulations? So, so we would know that um, if it isn't simply the case of making the data available. There are concerns about, uh, around privacy. There are concerns around security. There are concerns about interception and monitoring, confidentiality, you know, trade secrets, a number of, 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 of interrelated legal requirements, ethical concerns um, that, that need to be taken into account at the policy and regulatory level. So I want to share with you, um, there are a number of global projects that are looking at um, legal reform and, and, and sharing ideas on, on how um, you know, the law itself can be used to, to move the data for good movement forward. But I want to share with you um, something that, um, that I worked on, that we worked on um, for Media Monitoring Africa that is currently working on a PIA reform project. And that project has been driven mainly from a, um, a media rights perspective um, and, you know, access to information in the context of, of uh, media integrity. But the work that, that we did, um, and maybe, uh, you know, also 
um, taking the opportunity to bring Pyre more in line with, with 2020 was to try and look at some of the provisions that could stimulate openness and make it a more digitally savvy and piece of legislation. So it, what the submissions that we made to MMA and, um, and they have taken it forward in, in a number of uh, ways as part of their PIA reform project are substantial. But, but what I'll share with you is just some extracts to see how we can learn from what's going on in the rest of the world and how we can apply that um, more substantially uh, in the context of reform in South Africa. So through, through that project, what we did was um, look at various examples, models, um, inspiration documents um, that we could find um, that, that described openness principles out of a regulatory assessment that could be applied on, on any access to information law, any freedom of information law, and in this context was applied to, to PIA. So um, if we took the Open Data Charter and principle one of the Open Data Charter, which speaks about free access to and subsequent use of government data um, that would be of significant value to society and economy and should be open by default, um, there should also be confidence that open data will not compromise the right to privacy and that citizens would have the right to influence the collection and use of their personal data. Um, and, and if we translated that into regulatory assessment, for instance, we asked questions such as, does the law provide clear justifications as to why certain data cannot be released? Um, is the law cognizant of security, privacy, confidentiality and intellectual property regulation? Does the law include obligations to anonymize data prior to its publication, ensuring that um, personally identifiable data is removed? So you can see that what we've done is, is adapt what the principle is to a kind of assessment that would take us closer to amendments in, in PIO. So if we took principle three, for instance, from the open data charter was which is around accessible and usable data so um, they're describing that opening up data enables government citizens and civil society and private sector to make better informed decisions when the data is released it should be easily discoverable and accessible and made available without bureaucratic or administrative barriers which can deter people and you'll see how we then broke that up into um, specific requirements that we can place either in the text of PIRE or in accessibility guidelines, for instance, released as regulation under, under PIRE. So the law would specify that the bodies must release, da date, must release data in open formats to ensure that the data is available to a wide range of users. Um, it should be provided in multiple standardized formats so that it can be processed by computers and used by people. Um, it should be available free of charge under an open and unrestricted license. The data must be released without mandatory registration, for instance. So we took that principle of removal of barriers and then expanded that into something that can be um, regulated. If we took another model, such as the Open Gulf Partnership and the Meaningful Right of Access to Information, again, we could kick out a number of questions for the legislation as, as part of an assessment. So does the law specify proactive publication of government held information? Um, does the public sector commit to publishing information and publication of metadata on the system performance um, that is disaggregated by agency and the level of government? Does the public sector create more opportunities for citizens to use information and, and the future commitments to um, the right to access this also as part of the the doctrine of meaningful right of access to information again we could see the link between infrastructural aspects um, so ICT systems that would be have to be developed for record management reporting proactive disclosure responding to requests for access to information and then placing firm responsibilities in the legislation. So it's not just a case of we will publish the data, but actually the systems and infrastructure around that 
are, are also built by, by the public sector, so it enables access to information. So that's just an extract of something that is quite substantial and, and big. Um, but, um, but at the end of that process, I think there are a number of questions that still remain. And this is why it is such an intriguing area, um, an intriguing emerging area. So one of the questions is for a long time now, we have seen the right of access to information predominantly in the context of access to information um, of public sector data. So do we need access to data of private entities and what should their obligations be? Do our laws need to change to facilitate right of access to private entity data? Um, so are the obligations as they are set out in South Africa, for instance, which, um, which is not always the case in a number of countries that there are access to information obligations for, for private entities, but the way that it exists in the current access to information law, is there something that we need to change? Is the transparency and accountability um, uh, sufficient in the current legislation? How do we improve interoperability of data? How do we preserve the quality and integrity of data? So we don't just want data, but we want good data. We want good data that can be used for good. But how would we describe critical data? So there are going to be obligations for preservation and, and usability, and that can't be extended to all data that is held by organizations. So what would we describe as, as critical data that, that must be kept in good quality and made available. Um, what are the limits of proactive disclosure? Because it starts to intersect then, as I said, with privacy and confidentiality and so on. So what are the limits that we see for, for proactive disclosure? How do we deal with missing data? So what we know, um, and it's been diagnosed in research already, is that, is that the, the data that is collected is not always complete. Um, because it's collected for specific purposes and, um, and it's not, uh, you know, the future purposes are not envisaged at the time of collection. So how do we deal with missing data and how do we get better at trying to understand the multiple ways in which the data can be used and, and therefore in that way trying to get better at removing the missing links from, from important data. And then, of course, the, the very critical question um, is what are citizens' expectations of privacy and access to information? Because, you know, everyone has an interest in it. And, and I suppose, um, you know, from a data science perspective, they want as much access as possible to good data from, from the lawyer's perspective, from my perspective. I wants to see the data um, in, in data for good. But what do are, what are citizens actually want in terms of access to information? And we have to understand this because at the, at the time of collection of data, they will be the ones who will make decisions about what to share, what not to share, and what the limitations will be. So as we gear for what we anticipate in, in the 4 r or whatever we, we want to call it, we know that there are changes uh, coming in the way we uh, use uh, technology and the data that is collected and the permission spaces and so on. And so we do envisage that citizens will play a more active role um, in, in decision-making around their data. So it's good to foresee what their expectations will be. So just in conclusion, I think um, for me now, as he's visited, <laughs> I don't know if I want to be described as the as the foremother, as one of the foremothers in, in this area, but it's been roughly 20 years of, of working in this field, and what we've seen is dramatic evolution, drastic evolution in terms of the regulatory space. Um, interesting for me, and, um, and there's someone on this call who was, uh, who was in my class in 2001 um, uh, when we first did an LLM in, in, this, in this area. Um, what we see now is, um, is a greater significance being placed on human rights in the technology space. 
So um, not just from a constitutional drafting perspective, but also placing human rights really at that critical intersection of trade, security, cooperation between nations, um, and also vast um, developments in terms of digital, digital rights frameworks, trying to understand what that means and what its implications are for, for the digital divide, for instance. Um, so, so there is a greater significance around rights um, in, in the tech regulatory landscape. Um, and of course, the work continues in terms of bringing countries' laws and policies up to date um, so that there can be effective participation in the digital economy and to ensure that, you know, as this participation grows, we are also cognizant and aware of the implications on the rights of, of African citizens. And so taking care of, uh, of those dual uh, responsibilities. And, and for me, I think just in conclusion, I would say that this new look, I think, at access to information laws in the context of what it could mean in data-driven societies um, is, is a critical question. There are so many opportunities from an economic perspective, from a socioeconomic perspective, of course, and therefore um, I, I think that it's going to be one of those priority areas uh, for us in this field to, to wrap our heads around and make sure that we stay connected, one with the global developments, but also translate that for its implications for, for the continent. Um, thank you very much. Uh, this is currently, I should tell you, my favorite topics. I could go on and on and on about this, um, but I'm also happy to, to take questions now. Um, thank you, Prof. Chair Ciswear. Thank you. Thank you very much, Priya. Um, like I said um, earlier on, um, one of our four mothers, I repeat. <laughs> Lovely presentation, Priya. Um, you know, this online platform has its advantages. I've just noticed because you, you actually get to see those people who, who actually matter. You know, when you, when you have big conference halls and, and delegates are just being streamed in from different companies, you don't have this type of discourse. You know, here it's a very intimate discourse of, of, of cyber law and cyber professionals. And it's, it's only when one gets to see a presentation like the one you've just presented that one really sees the, the, the vast areas that can be discussed. Let me not take away your thunder, Priya. Um, there's a comment here from Advocate in Saluba. As always, Priya has been so great on collateral benefication how could we utilize data for good movement to insulate humanity against the gruesome spread of COVID in rural areas? That's from Advocate in Zaluba. I, I think that's a question for the data scientists. Um, so, so I wish I had the, the, the answer to that, but I think, I mean, I'm going to call out uh, Tengiwe is also on this call, I think, the work that they have done over the year um, in terms of, of privacy. And I think the, you know, the broad range of issues that they've tackled means that it hasn't been just considering the urban citizen or the challenges of the urban citizen. So I think, you know, we, I think there has been some effort as we have innovated around COVID-19 to make sure that, um, that we have, uh, you know, um, addressed some of the human rights concerns or at least kept it front and center. And, 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 and I think at least the discourse has been there and the awareness has been there of what kind of redress we would like to see in the future and so on. So I think this community is the community that will need to be the custodians um, of that insulation of humanity um, over, over the next few months, over the next few years. And, and if you haven't yet, then uh, definitely engage with the work that's being done by Center for Human Rights. Um, and and Tlingue, I think it will also be interesting to then take some of those discussions we've been having in the policy and regulatory circles and take it to the actual techies and, and the data science guys and, and make sure they understand what, uh, what the risks are. 
Thank you, Priya. Um, let me get to the next question. It's from InterConsult 21 Global. Awareness of abuse of data is very important for both the public and the individual. Very good to interact at city, municipal level across countries. Awareness can contribute to the increased protection and at the same time informing about systematic local, national, global crimes. Thank you, Dr. Priya Chetty. I think I've just been promoted by uh, by this intervention, so, so <laughs> not quite a doctor, um, but, uh, but but working on it. It's a clean comment, though. You want to comment? Comment. And I I agree entirely. I think you know the, the work that needs to be done. I think um, is to make sure that these conversations are happening within those rooms where all the excitement is, because I think. Uh, the more that we expose people to, you know, to what the potential abuses are, the more it's going to influence the practices at the point of collection, um, and and the more it's going to influence the the governance that is also driven from a values perspective. If there are humans there who just won't abuse children's data, or there are humans there that are not willing to manipulate data. Um, you know that's going to be that's going to be key. And if there are humans there that understand what the risks are economically and at a human rights level from exploitation of data or abuse of data, um, I think that that's going to help us. So one of the lessons for us, I think, is to take this conversation beyond the policy uh, types and the and the legal types and and make sure that we are bringing um, the technology firms closer. Thank you, Priya. And then the next comment is, again, I see you have fans, Priya. <laughs> the, next, the, the next comment is from African Zaluba again. FOSS has not managed to get traction within South Africa. How do you see open data movement existing side by side with security protocols? GDPR and data sharing across jurisdictions how these impact on data for good movement. Do you want to comment yeah. on that? No, for sure. I think, um, I mean, it's interesting when, when you, if you think about FOSS and you think about the policy side of it, it's almost non-existent. Um, you know, we, whatever we have is very theoretical um, and hasn't been implemented. I think CETA was charged with responsibility for the FOSS policy a number of years ago, and we haven't seen it really take off. So, so you're quite right that you know it, it, it's 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 irrelevant. Um, at the same time, um, that's not to say that open source is is irrelevant because despite the policy not having much utility and and not being uh, uh, taken up, um, it hasn't impacted the rollout of open source. So. You know whether we whether we realize it or not, uh, we live in a in in an open source society now, and and the advances that we have seen from a tech on the tech front would not have been possible had we not seen that rapid uptake of open source principles. So I would argue that open source itself, so on the tech side, on the science side, has has progressed, even though the policy has become irrelevant. Um, it's, it's certainly within the open data space. I think that the level of maturity that we sit with now is that we do acknowledge this interrelation between security and privacy and so on. And, and we didn't at the time of, um, you know, of, of writing those early policies and, and regulations and so on. So I think we, we do have a shot now at something that is more entrenched, that is more embedded, and that is a, a lot more realistic and pragmatic. So in those regulatory assessments that uh, you, know, you saw with the, the number of questions, I think we also have to be careful that we are not overextending what it is that we would like to achieve. There are a few key things that, that we need to, to get off. Let's not overcomplicate it. Uh, but also let's draw in a crowd of, of influences to make sure that it, that the open data 
tech community is not alone and that the lawyers and the policy um, and the policy advocates and so on go behind them and give them something within frameworks and regulation that is realistic and can take the, the movement further. Thank you, Priya. Then we have another one from Interconsult 21 Global. I refer to the two ways of data repository. Government has the data. Individuals now have the right and should have the right to access um, the government and what data it has. Um, if we want to look at the data, the Danish, sorry, model. How do you comment about that, Priya? Mm. I think I think it's it's quite right because it places the citizen and the individual at the core of the way we see this, and I think that's also a shift um, from from how we've seen it before in terms of you know being excited about um, saving costs on tech and development and so on. So I think that it. That, that really is, is the case. Um, essentially, if we want to understand the global experience and the story and the narrative, we have to understand that it's comprised of millions of pieces of individual experiences that make up that narrative. And so if we, for instance, can't um, address the issue of people being afraid to share certain information that can be used for good, um, so, you know, there's nothing in the data will essentially be in, in you know, uh, have, have lost its utility. We need uh, for people from everywhere to understand and appreciate how the data can be used and subscribe to some of these principles and contribute their data and so on. So an example of that is just, you know, with the, the contact tracing applications now. Um, you know, theoretically, we should see a bigger uptake of it because it's data that's being used for good. Um, but but we're not seeing that. So there are these human barriers that that we do have to address. We have to place the citizen and the individual um, at the core of what we do. Thank you, Priya. Um, I must say you have um, quite a lot of questions. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Priya, for an insightful presentation. What would you say are the persisting challenges that are inhibiting effective implementation of open data? And that is a question from Advocate Chikalange. I suppose that's, you know, that's, that's the thing to, to work on is that um, we, what we've never had before is something comprehensive um, that, that diagnoses um, you know the the barriers and how we can overcome the barriers, and um, and and that's what we need. Um, so for as long as we remain at the level where we are excited about open data, but we uh, and but we have not engaged with the the kind of grassroots facilities in the legal frameworks that we need to just get it going. Uh, we're we're not going to get it going. Certainly not at the scale that um, that that we need to. So um, so I think that's that's the work that that needs to be done. Okay, now Priya, I don't want to um, curtail any of our participants. I think you're going to have to note down these questions because they're from the same person. Um, <laughs> A question from Mustafa Mansour, consultant, surgeon, and director from the United Kingdom. How can we ensure the balance between data, patient security, and ensuring the natural flow of data across the world for research purposes? Balance, in my opinion, is crucial. Welcome your comments. Then we have another uh, a question from uh, Mustafa Mansur, um, how can we ensure the balance between data patient, no, but that's the same one. <laughs> Hold on. The, the next one is on the question of what are citizens' expectations of citizens in terms of data privacy and decision making on what you share. When I engage in our community awareness programs, it doesn't seem like 
citizens are aware of their digital human rights um, and therefore are vulnerable online. So that's advocate Chikalange. And then she points out as well two issues in terms of awareness perspective. He says uh, digital human rights must on the one hand, uh, the, the vulnerable must be made aware of their rights and they must understand what their rights are. Um, hope you're jotting this down. Um, okay, yeah. <laughs> so that's your questions, Bria. <laughs> okay. um, no, thank you. I think um, to answer the first question, um, just from the health perspective, I think um, more than just saying that there is an interrelation between topics such as access to information and privacy and security and so on. There's also an interrelation between sectoral approaches. So, um, so I think that, um, you know, the further one goes into, into um, this field and the more there is uh, an investment in innovation in, in this field, the more it would bring out regulation such as HIPAA even, um, you know, legislation that would go directly to the public sector, um, sorry, to the, to the health sector. And, um, and in, the same, in, in the same vein, I think in a number of other sectors, there would be le legislation that would drive how information can be used in that sector. And so I think what we need to do from a regulatory perspective is make sure that we, that we spread these principles and the governance frameworks all the way. So it isn't, um, and we have to do it in a way that's very smart because what we can't do is take every single piece of legislation and start amending it. What we need are overriding data governance models and we need a sectoral conformance to the data governance models. And so um, specifically in the UK, there's already, there are already initiatives from a data governance perspective that really reimagines how data moves from person to person and on what basis and so on. And that's what we need in a number of other countries as well. And then the, the overriding data governance models has to be, uh, has to seep down uh, into the sectors to, to make, um, to get to those nitty gritty questions in each sector. And uh, the second question, of course, I, I agree that the citizen is completely vulnerable. Um, at the same time, I'm also trying to wrap my head around why there isn't a barrier to, um, to uptake of certain innovative tech from a fear perspective. But there seems to be a barrier at the moment uh, when it comes to understanding and implementing data privacy. So I think we're, we could be making the wrong assumption if we think that it's a case of, um, you know, a sophisticated topic that, that people can't, uh, that don't want to engage on. I don't think it's that at all. I think that uh, what, we, what we have not done is made the case to say that you can't use the tech without being a responsible citizen in terms of managing your privacy and your permissions and so on. So I think we have to make a stronger case um, for people to, to understand why it needs to be done. Um, and certainly will be able to change their settings and to be, to be uh, participating more heavily in the way their information is consumed. Thank you very much, Priya. Um, yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was lovely. And, you know, having you, whether in person or online, it's just Priya. So that was, that was really lovely. It's, it, it, I, I like the way that you answered the questions and the questions that came from the floor. Um, it, it really means that there's further discussion necessary on this point. Now, I thank you one last time. Thanks. Uh, then we have our last speaker for the morning session.